Thanks. Today in the United States, we're seeing a tectonic shift in the patient-physician relationship. What used to be a very paternalistic and top-down relationship has become a more cooperative and collaborative one. So it's time that we as patients raise our voices to ensure that the uh, care and the treatment we receive is aligned with our own personal preferences and values and priorities, to ensure that we are treated as human beings, to ensure that we are respected in our care and that we are not just treated as an illness. It's time to raise our voices and get off the sidelines. But in order to do so, it's going to require that we unlearn certain ingrained behaviors because unfortunately the patient voice has been muted for many, many years. So let's take a look way, way back uh, to the Hippocratic Oath, an oath that's still taken by physicians today. Uh, it was written in the fifth century BC in ancient Greece, and it was really written to uphold a physician's ethical standards. But when you read the text, it's actually a very patient-centered text. It reads in the ancient version, uh, whatsoever house I may enter, I shall do so for the advantage and the convenience of the patient. Even in the modern version, which was revised in 1964, it says, I will remember that I do not treat a, a fever chart or a cancerous growth, but I treat a sick human being whose illness may affect his or her family and their financial well-being. So even in this language that was designed to uphold the ethical standards of the physician, the patient was front and center. So what changed? Even, uh, even if we look at care in the 19th and uh, early 20th century in this country, patients were still at the center of care. Doctors made house calls. Doctors treated an entire family. They treated a patient over the course of uh, his or her entire lifetime. Doctors were present and known in our communities. They were respected, they were highly regarded, and they knew their patients in the communities. And truthfully, in the absence of advanced tests, the absence of uh, technology, what a patient had to say about his or her own uh, illness, their symptoms, their side effects, was often really what mattered the most. Well, the 20th century has ushered in major advances in medicine and care uh, and technology. And this has no doubt <laughs> saved uh, countless lives. However, these advances, MRIs, PET scans, screening tools, diagnostic tools, have really begun to wedge their way in between the patient and the doctor. We are really witnessing the mass institutionalization of healthcare in this country. Over the past century, we've seen uh, the emergence of labor unions. We've seen big government programs like Medicare and Medicaid. We've seen the emergence of huge uh, health insurance companies. We've moved to a corporate and institutional model where the patient is not necessarily any longer at the center uh, of care. C care now is made based on formulas, not on your individual uh, needs. Treatment decisions are made based on actuarial models, not based on what you are telling the doctor that you need. We're seeing the emergence of, of panels that are making decisions about your care and not necessarily your doctor. And so all of these corporate and institutional influences have, have tended to mute and tamp down the patient voice. Today, interestingly, we're seeing the fruits of the uh, protest movements from the 1960s. And these movements really symbolized uh, equality. They symbolized empowerment. They challenged uh, authority. And even today, patients want to be empowered. They want to be advocates. They want to get their own information, understand their diseases. The internet is certainly making this uh, a lot easier. But sometimes that empowered patient, it can create a confrontational relationship between the patient and the doctor. So we have to find the right balance and we have to help patients find the tools and find uh, the resources so they can be 
an empowered patient so that they can work in partnership with the physician and with the healthcare team. We are starting to see healthcare bend towards the wants and needs of the patient. Uh, I think that walk-in clinics are a great example. They're open early, they're open late, they're open on the weekends, they're open at our convenience, they're quick and easy to use. Even on a policy level, the Affordable Care Act has mandated the formation of something called PCORI, which is the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. PCORI was formed to study different models of patient-centered care around the country, to look for ways that we can improve quality in healthcare and decrease cost. So many, many models that are emerging. Look at electronic medical records. Electronic medical records have made it easier for us as patients to access our own medical information through a simple patient portal and an internet connection. And certainly, we are seeing a proliferation of health-related apps where we as patients, as consumers, can track our own health and wellness information and medical information, and there's more to come. So as we see the system leaning towards the patient, we also see on the other side of that that oftentimes patients are not ready for this new model of patient-centered care. They don't necessarily have the tools uh, and the resources that they need to be engaged. Why is that happening? One of the reasons we know at the cancer support community is that patients are still facing many, many significant medical and practical challenges when they're diagnosed with cancer, as an example. We know, for example, that there are patients out there who are dealing with a loss of income, uh, bankruptcy, depression, anxiety. All of these are things that come along with the diagnosis. From a medical standpoint, we talk to patients who are trying to decide which doctor to see or not see because they can't afford that $75 copay. We have patients who are putting off uh, scans. They're, they're making trade-offs and decisions around their health care. But even aside from those medical questions, there are a whole host of other collateral costs that come along with the cancer diagnosis or the diagnosis of any uh, serious illness. We see uh, patients who are traveling great distances to see uh, in-network doctors. We see patients who are cutting their uh, grocery expenses in order to afford their medicine. They're taking money out of their retirement fund. They're taking money out of their kid's college fund in order to afford their health care, to afford their cancer care. So we see the challenges and the barriers that are getting in the way of patients truly being educated, empowered, and activated. So how does the patient voice get heard? Well, you have to talk and you have to listen. You have to engage in a process of shared decision-making with your doctor and with your health care team. You have to talk to your doctor about what are my goals of treatment? For a cancer patient, it may be a cure. It may, it may simply be to control pain or control other symptoms and side effects of the illness. So you have to work in partnership with your doctor. You have to spend as much time or more researching your healthcare question as you would researching buying a new car or buying a new computer. These are critical issues and an investment that patients have to make. Make a list of questions for your doctor. Prepare to go in for that visit. Bring a friend or family member into the visit with you to help you keep track of the information. Contact a social worker, a counselor in your community if you're really struggling with what your priorities are and what you want to share with the doctor. There are all these tools that are available to you to raise your voice. One thing that we started to observe was that it was important not just for each individual patient to raise their voice, but to also look for an opportunity to raise the collective voice of many patients. In the past year, nearly 10,000 cancer patients and survivors have joined a national cancer registry to share their voice, to share their experience, to share their concerns through the cancer journey. What are we learning from this? An incredible amount. We're learning about some of the common experiences and challenges that all cancer patients are having throughout the course of a cancer diagnosis. But what we're also learning is that many patients with different types of cancers 
are facing different challenges. As an example, we're seeing many patients who are dealing with cancer over a long period of time, managing cancer as a chronic illness. Well, that's the good news, right? But the challenge is that these patients are dealing with the short-term and long-term side effects of cancer and cancer treatment, and they're dealing with the short-term and long-term financial impact of cancer. Some patients may be on cancer therapy for the rest of their lives. And that, in and of itself, raises a whole other set of challenges. So y you may be asking, why does this really matter? Don't we have enough technology? Don't we have these PET scans, CAT scans, diagnostic tests, gene mapping, to know everything that we need to know to provide quality cancer care in this country? Well, I could quote a lot of studies, give you a lot of statistics, but instead I'm going to finish by telling you a story. This is a story of a classically trained pianist who was diagnosed with advanced stage cancer. Her doctor was going to prescribe a course of therapy that led to a side effect called peripheral neuropathy. This creates a burning, a tingling, a numbness, a lack of feeling in the, in the hands and in the feet. She hadn't shared with her doctor that the most important thing to her was to be able to play the piano every day for the rest of her life. Well, she met with a decision counselor, and she talked about these values and priorities and wishes. She went back and had that conversation with the doctor, and he was able to prescribe a different course of treatment that did not have neuropathy as a side effect. There is no test, no scan, no screening tool that could have arrived at that critical information. So with 77 million baby boomers <laughs> in this country, and with an anticipated shortage of, of healthcare workers, we, as patients and consumers, must learn to become our own best advocates. We must learn to navigate a system that is in crisis. It's time for us to raise our voices. It's time for us to get off of the sidelines and get into the game. Thank you.